They're taking over. We just let them come. Once we had an empire, now we got some. White power! White power! Greetings, it's your host, Gabe Morales, returning here for part two of our series on Northwest Aryan Gangs. In part one, we mainly covered white prison gangs. In this session, we will cover some of the historical white power groups outside of prison, as well as cover umbrella groups active in and out of prison, such as skinheads and packerwoods. For a good overview of the current situation, see a previous episode on this channel with my guest, Matt Browning of the Skinhead Intelligence Network. While some groups like Richard Butler, deceased in 2004, and his Aryan Nations were dominant in the white movement, as well as groups like the Order, these supreme white power groups all fell into disarray and split into warring factions. Groups like the Ku Klux Klan are still around and white supremacist groups like the white Aryan resistance were active, but new groups were taking their place all the time. The Order, also known as Bruderschweigen, German for Brothers Keep Silent, was also known as the Silent Brotherhood and were part of the Aryan Resistance Movement. This was a white supremacist terrorist organization very active in the United States between September 1983 and December 1984. Many in the Order or Silent Brotherhood were supporters of the Aryan Nation, but they became very impatient with AN leader Richard Butler, who had headquarters in Sand Point, Idaho, for being all talk and no action. They wanted white revolution, and they wanted it now. The group raised funds for his mission via armed robberies. Eventually, 10 members were caught, convicted, and tried for racketeering. And two members were convicted for their role in the 1984 murder of Denver radio talk show host Alan Berg. The order had been founded by Robert J. Matthews in late September 1983 at his farm near Medellin, Washington located north of Spokane and just south of the Canadian border. It was at Matthews Farm where members of the order were trained. A fundamental goal of the group was revolution against the American government, which its members believe were controlled by prominent Jews and international Jew conspirators in the government who had loyalty to Israel rather than loyalty to the American nation. The order was named after and partly modeled on a fictional terrorist group in William Luther Pierce's novel, The Turner Diaries. Members of the order included Randy Evans, Gary Yarbo, Bruce Pierce, Denver Parmenter, Frank De Silva, also known as Frank Silva, Richard Scutari, Randy Dewey, and David Tate. In December 1984, authorities were able to track down Matthews to a house on Woodby Island, where he refused to surrender. During a shootout with law enforcement, the house was ignited by incendiary flares and became engulfed in flames, and Matthew was killed. Today, he is considered a martyr by some white nationalists. Another individual associated with the order was David Lane, who was incarcerated for many years in the federal BOP, where he obtained a very large following and was the creator of the 14 words. We must secure the existence of our people in a future for white children. Lane died on May 28, 2007, at Terre Haute in the federal BOP. A month later, white supremacists all over the United States held memorial demonstrations. In addition to David Lane, Billy Roper Jr.'s White Revolution was a neo-Nazi hate group that was active in Arkansas that started in 2002. Roper founded his organization as an anti-Semitic group and worked with Aryan Nation's founder, Richard Butler, as well as Tom Metzger of the White Aryan Resistance. Roper now leads the Shield Wall Network, a white nationalist organization with the goal of building a white ethno state. Most of these types of groups today use the internet to recruit followers. They will also quote the Bible to justify their actions in an attempt to bring in more radical Christian fundamentalists. There are many factions in the skinhead movement, which began in England in the late 1960s, starting out as soccer hooligan fans. They're based on a working class struggle for equality as more and more immigrants came in from other countries and competed with white jobs. Short hair was the original cut for hygienic purposes. Doc Martin boots, bomber jackets, and blue jeans were sensible for the types of jobs held by most youth in the slums of London. At the time, they were drawn to ska music as it went against the man or the government. 
They had a slow start in the United States, but gained strength by 1985. Original skinheads are known as traditional skinheads or trads. New recruits are often referred to as fresh cuts for the shaved heads. There is a multiracial faction of skins called Sharps, or Skinheads Against Racial Prejudice, that started around 1987. They look a lot and act like a lot of other skinheads. For instance, they are also into neo-punk music, blending sky with raggy, and will give a gritty raw scream of oi. Sharps just don't believe in the racial hate philosophy element of the movement, and they often will battle racist skinheads. Sharps may also align with other groups like anarchists and Antifa. Soon, some skins began to take on racial ideology, and they often targeted minorities who they felt were encroaching on the white man's world. These racist skinheads spread hate via race-based music and bands like Screwdriver, as well as in magazines and on websites. A popular term used by them was Rahawa, or racial horde war. They also referred to politicians as being part of Zog which stood for Zionist Occupied Government. Just like many other white supremacists, this comes from a belief that Jews have taken over many parts of our society. On the night of November 12, 1988, Ken, Death, Mitchke, Kyle Brusker, and Steve Strasser were members of a group known as the Eastside White Pride in Portland, which was a skinhead group that was affiliate of the White Aryan Resistance, were driving around Portland with their girlfriends headed home. The three white men confronted two black men, including Murugeta Serwa, who had been dropped off in front of his apartment. Subsequently, Serwa was beaten to death with a baseball bat and was left in a puddle of his own blood. Serwa died in the early morning hours of the following day. Later on, Mitski said he and the others killed Serwa because of his race. In 1990, Mitski was convicted of first-degree murder and given a life sentence until he died on July 26, 2011 at the age of 45. At the time of his death, he was still being referred to as being a prisoner of war by many white power groups. This is a common term they will use for Caucasians who are arrested and imprisoned for racial crimes. After the men were sentenced in 1990, white Aaron resistance leader Tom Metzger and his son John Metzger were sued on behalf of Sir Wall's family by the Southern Poverty Law Center and the Anti-Defamation League. Metzger quickly declared bankruptcy and said that his movement will not be stopped by the puny town of Portland. On July 26, 1993, police arrested two Washington residents, Jeremiah Gordon Knessel and Wayne Paul Wooten, both 19 at the time, for shoplifting at a mall parking lot in Salinas, California. During a search of Knessel's car, officers uncovered three pipe bombs, four loaded long barrel weapons, military apparel, ammunition, wigs, climbing gear, white supremacist literature, and a page from a Portland, Oregon telephone book listing Jewish agencies and synagogues. Under questioning by the FBI, Knessel confessed to his involvement in the July 20th, 1993 bombing of the NAACP office in Tacoma, Washington. Knessel also implicated Mark Frank Kowalski, a.k.a. Mark Stevenson, as a Nick Khan and member of a skinhead group, American Front. Kowalski was arrested the same day in Seattle and charged with being a convicted felon in possession of destructive advice. I dealt with Kowalski while he was housed at the King County Jail, as well as many other prominent skinheads and white supremacists while I worked there. Volk's Front was an American white separatist organization founded on October 20th, 1994 in Portland, Oregon. Volk's Front means People's Front and was founded by Randall Lee Crager and Richard Ardern while they're incarcerated in the Oregon Department of Corrections in 1994. It was formed from the remnants of several fractured Portland skinhead groups, including Eastside White Pride, whose members were convicted of the murder of Mulagueta Serra, as discussed earlier. Craig was serving two years for a 1992 assault on an African-American man who was left paralyzed and had a conviction of first-degree intimidation for threats to murder an anti-fascist activist. According to Volk's Front now defunct website, the group described itself as an international fraternal organization for persons of European descent. The logo of Volk's Front was the August rune, a common rune used as a neo-Nazi symbol among other organizations such as the National Alliance, which was led by William Pierce. Volk's Front had approximately 50 members in the United States 
split between four chapters and an additional 50 members dispersed in other countries. But they also had many sympathizers. The goal of the movement was to create an all-white homeland in the Pacific Northwest. In August 2012, the United States branch of Volkfront announced their dissolution, citing harassment and investigation by authorities. So the group said it was disbanding. But as we've seen many times, when these groups dissolve, others usually pop up in their place. The Aryan soldiers started in 2005 inside the Oregon Department of Corrections. They had a skinhead ideology and a high propensity for violence towards staff and other inmates. This, of course, caused the majority of AS members to be locked up in special housing units. Several AS members had to be housed out of state or in the federal BOP. The Aryan soldiers believed themselves to be the only true representative for all white gangs in Oregon DOC and considered all other white gangs to be lames and frauds. Their leadership structure consists of a three-man commission and lieutenants. In 2006, the AS declared war against the European kindred for disrespect issues inside the intensive management unit at the Oregon State Penitentiary. They also declared war against Supreme White Aryan Knights and other white groups. As I said, they believe themselves to be the true top dogs for white prisoners within the state of Oregon. Based in the United Kingdom, Blood and Honor was a shadowy international coalition of racist skinheads. In the United States, there were two rival groups who claimed to be affiliated with Blood and Honor. One was known as the American Division of Blood and Honor, and another was known as the Blood and Honor Council USA, which at one time was affiliated with the skinhead group, the Vinlander Scholarship Club. I don't hear too much about Blood and Honor anymore. Let me know if I'm correct. They seem to have faded out. The Northwest Boot Boys are another group active in the Pacific Northwest that are skinheads, and they have been involved in several crimes also. Hawk and Crew Skinheads started out as a white supremacist prison gang in 2000 within the Washington Department of Corrections, but later they spread out to the streets. The group's name is in reference to the German word for hooked crossed or swastika. They are very big in Washington State, and as I stated in part one of this series, some of them once supported the Aryan family. But later, there were some differences in opinion that led them to being rivals. In 2017, Olympia, Washington police arrested racist can hit Frank Glenn Cole for an armed robbery that occurred on December 29, 2016. Cole had an extensive criminal history and was documented as being a Hawk and Cruz member. He was just the latest of several persons associated with Hawk and Cruz to be arrested in recent years. Another Hawk and Cruz affiliate, Daniel Brett Rowe of Richmond, Washington, was arrested in August 2016 for allegedly stabbing an interracial couple outside an Olympia bar after seeing the two kiss. Also in 2016, Brent Ward Luster was arrested after an 18-hour manhunt involving multiple law enforcement agencies in the Pacific Northwest. He was identified as being a suspect in a triple homicide after a fourth shooting victim a woman shot in the face and bleeding somehow managed to escape the shooting in Woodland, located just north of Vancouver, Washington, and she reported it to police. Looster was well known to me and many others who tracked white supremacists as being very violent and very intense in his beliefs. He was also tied to Hawk and Cruz, as well as the Nordic or Pacific Northwest Wolf Pack, a loosely associated alliance of racist kinheads that includes Hawk and Cruz. Looster is covered in skinhead ink, including his backpack that reads a popular term, Rahawa, which is short for racial holy war. And there are many other Supreme White Power groups active in the Pacific Northwest. A good book to read is Skinhead Confessions, From Hate to Hope, by my brother T.J. Layden. Rest in peace. I did a memorial for T.J. on this channel after his death in 2021 that tells more about his life. Perkowitz was a name that was originally considered derogatory. It was used by black inmates to describe a white convict. Today, many white convicts use Peckerwood as a badge of honor. The difference I've seen between skinheads and Peckerwoods is Peckerwoods have white pride, but they will still talk to blacks and do deals with them in custody. They're usually more disorganized than skinheads, but will organize themselves based on their geographic area, such as the San Fernando Valley Peckerwoods located just north of Los Angeles. They will often use the symbol of Woody Woodpecker. Peckerwoods, like all other white gangs, will often settle disputes through the use of violence 
and they will usually back up white inmates in custody. One such group in Oregon is the Insane Peckerwood Syndicate, or Insane Peckerwood Society. The IPS was first started in 1997 by David Greedy Smith Clark, who was later an inmate at the Marion County Correctional Facility in Oregon. Clark put on an IPS tattoo on his neck, but had no luck getting support, so he left the state. By 2002, another inmate was discovered to have a tattoo of IPS on his neck in the same location as Clark. This inmate admitted to becoming a member in Lynn County, Oregon. It was believed that they created a structure of a Don, or a leader, two captains, lieutenants, and sergeants. IPS eventually became active at the Oregon State Penitentiary in a limited capacity, and they may also tattoo 5150 for being crazy. The Southern Poverty Law Center currently has over a dozen active hate groups in the Pacific Northwest, and I believe there are many smaller ones they missed. These groups have included white supremacists, white nationalists, neo-Nazis, even some black separatists. And as I stated throughout this episode, not all of these factions get along. In fact, it seems like they mostly fight among themselves. The Pacific Northwest has had some Nazi lowriders and public enemy number one of members who started in California, and you can catch more about them in my AB book or my AB video that can be found on this channel. I have interviewed some of them as well as Dirty White Boys, which is an interstate gang which started off as a softball team. As I repeated several times, as with other ethnic gangs described in my books and videos, gangs mostly prey on their own. In custody, I noticed that white prisoners will often adorn themselves with Vikings, Nazi soldiers, ancient runes, and other symbols of European culture. They will often have tattoos and drawings and jail and prison of white pride and supreme white power. They're basically trying to show that they're proud to be white and will not be victimized by other races or gangs. This can be very appealing as a show of power and protection for new Caucasian inmates locked up in the criminal justice system. But often these new recruits find themselves doing attacks, smuggling drugs, and engaging in other acts that just get them more time. And the guys who are recruiting them are often doing life and manipulate the younger ones to do their bidding. If the new recruit does not follow orders, the individual often finds himself placed on a hit list. So what can be done about prison gangs like the Aryan Family, European Kindred, Aryan Knights, or other security threat groups I've talked about? I contend the general public must first be educated about what to look for. I contend that parents and the general public must first be educated about what to look for. Early indicators like gang graffiti, change in dress, youngsters wearing gang paraphernalia, increased drug sales and use, and crimes committed. Yes, it starts off with misdemeanors. It concerns me today that misdemeanors are considered basically to be off limits. I don't believe this is teaching our young people the right lessons. There has to be some consequence for their actions. I'm not saying that every youngster that steals a car needs to be locked up in jail or prison, but it can't be all carrot and no stick, and it can't be all stick and no carrot. Parents must not be in denial that it can't happen to their kid, because it can and sometimes will. I do not want to leave you with the impression that all whites in the Pacific Northwest are violent races. No. Only a very small portion are, but I wanted you to be aware of them, as I feel it is very important to be updated on these groups and individuals. So I hope you learned a thing or two from this video. As always, if you disagree with any part of it, please let me know in the comment section. But be advised, I will not tolerate any disrespect to me or any other good individual or group. If you do so, your comment will quickly be removed and you will be banned from viewing this channel. I hope you have a good year as we climb out of this pandemic. I hope you see that in spite of some negative things happening in our world and country, there are still lots of good people who want to make this a better place to exist for all people and to make a better future for all of our children. Next time, this is Gabe Morales, Gangsters, Cops, and Politicians. Once we had it.